All right. So, so tell me if there's any freezing or things are not working well, just please let me know as soon as you can. But I think it might be better now. And I, I just want to start by noting that I think this is something I gather many people have been eager to talk about for a while now. And I've, I've put off talking about it in part because it seemed to me spending some extended time talking about the Supreme Court uh, was important. Important. If you remember at the conclusion of that Supreme Court series, I asked if we were maybe paying too much attention to the wrong coup, that, that the slow motion coup that was occurring within the bounds of legality that was being brought about primarily by the Supreme Court in concert with the Republican Party in ways that may make it possible for the Republican Party to stably translate minority support from voters into majority power in federal or national government is a bending of our institutions to resist the will of the popular majority. And in one sense, that does appear to be coup-like. And, and, and so uh, with, without, um, uh, in any way taking that back, that, that that may actually be the more important long-term threat to democracy in the United States today. It doesn't mean we shouldn't also be paying attention to what happened on January 6th of 2021. And I think as we're now learning a, in fact, much more concerted protracted effort that that day is, if you will, the tip of the iceberg of a months long conspiracy to change the outcome of the popular vote. And in the narrower sense, a much clearer uh, illustration of the idea of a coup that was orchestrated from the White House by the President of the United States and uh, a direct attack on perhaps the core institution of American democracy, the idea that our leader is determined, our leaders are determined by the outcome of free, fair, open elections in which the person who registers the victory, gets the most votes, is the person who then assumes the office. And, and, and that uh, what happened in the buildup to January 6th is that Donald Trump, the president of the United States, lost an election, knew in advance that he was likely to lose the election, uh, was presented with substantial evidence that there was no way to construe the outcome as anything but a loss, and then attempted to subvert the outcome of the election. And so in a sense, my, my big question here today is what do we do, right? What, what do we do when the president tries to subvert the outcomes of the election in order to retain power? And in particular, when we are in the very sticky situation of the subsequent administration of a rival party deciding whether or not to prosecute the leader of the rival party, the, the potential candidate for the presidency in the next presidential election. We have never done that before. I don't think we've ever really faced this situation before. And, and so let me start with uh, a, a contrast or two. One contrast would be with Richard Nixon. And if you remember what happened as he was impeached and then the Senate began to prepare for his trial. He got a, an emissary from the Senate, I believe it was Barry Goldwater, who said to him, look, you, you do not have the votes in the Senate to acquit you. You will be convicted. And Richard Nixon therefore resigned and, and left office in disgrace. And I, I wanna focus there for a moment on the Republican senators, right? And the idea that though Nixon was of their party, though he was at the time that the uh, inquiry began a quite popular leader, though he had an unpopular and little known bumbling vice president, they nevertheless put fidelity to the 
law and norms of democracy, that our president cannot be someone who violates the law and lies about it above partisan advantage. And then if we turn to Donald Trump's second impeachment inquiry, not the one concerning the Ukraine, which if, if you look back at now, the idea that Rudy Giuliani was the, the back channel to uh, Vladimir Zelensky, trying to get Zelensky coerced into delivering dirt on Joe Biden's son in order to get military aid, right? Not only in light of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, does that look still more suspicious, but it's also in a sense a similar cast of characters, the formal advisors to the president, the formal officials at of the State Department, I'm willing to do what he wants them to do. And so instead, he opens a back channel. And as it turns out, in the aftermath of losing the presidential election, Donald Trump mainly is not supported by his own cabinet, his own administration, and turns again to Rudy Giuliani and other um, officials, I shouldn't say officials, advisors with less official role and less scruples, right? And, 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 and so unlike what happened with Richard Nixon, in the second impeachment hearing proceedings, the Republican Party's unwilling to convict and unwilling to convict, it appears, I think, in retrospect, based on a narrow technicality. He soon won't be president. You can't impeach somebody who <clears throat> isn't even in the office. And please note, had they impeached in the winter of 2021, Merrick Garland would not be facing the question that he's facing in the summer of 2022. Should he do something that has never been done before in the United States, and that is to open a prosecution against a former president, a president of the other party, a president who is still the leader of the other party and potentially Merrick Garland's boss's rival in the next election, right? And, and, and so we have here, right, the, the, the chilling image. And, and, and we now know in a little bit more detail, this is not just right a noose over the heart of American democracy, the institution that we have invested with the power to make laws for us and hammer out our differences. It seems to be a powerful symbol of the erosion of faith in democracy. We also know that this noose was intended for Mike Pence in particular, that is to say the vice president of the United States. We, we, we also obviously have Donald Trump and we have learned more and more, not only about his role in instigating the invasion of the Capitol on January 6th, but in leading a months long effort to overturn the election and hence to defraud the American people. And then we have the committee conducting the current public investigation, which I'll talk about in just a moment, and Merrick Garland at the crux of the whole thing, trying to decide whether to prosecute or not. So just a little bit of background, and, and I'm going to assume that you're familiar with and following the hearing somewhat, and, and so I'm not going to do a blow-by-blow blow recounting, and please note that we are still in the middle of these hearings, right? And, and there's a sense in which I believe they are gaining some momentum similar to what happened with the Watergate hearings, and in, in two regards, more witnesses are now coming forward and willing to testify. It's, it's not entirely clear how much new information will be revealed, but it is the case that a more complete and compelling picture of what occurred in and around uh, January 6th, but also in the couple months after Donald Trump lost the election and before the invasion, what was occurring in the White House. Um, among 
the witnesses. I've, I've just kind of chosen a few that seem to me to be particularly important, right? Carolyn Edwards as the face of the Capitol Police recounting in vivid detail the harrowing and dangerous spectacle of a crowd overpowering the Capitol Police in order to break into the Capitol. We, we have Jung Pak of, of, of the Justice Department, Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State of Georgia, uh, Jung Pak also in Georgia. Uh, Pak resigned rather than following Trump's orders to try to call the Georgia election into question. Raffensperger, we've got the transcript or the recording of the conversation between him and Trump in which Trump spends an hour trying to persuade, cajole, or bully Raffensperger into uh, finding 11,000 votes. It's unclear whether those are votes for him or finding 11,000 fraudulent votes to subtract from Biden. Um, we have Cassidy Hutchinson, Mark Meadows' assistant, who has given us a, a lot of insight into Trump's state of mind and actions or inactions on January 6th, including the idea that he himself wanted to join the armed mob that was invading the Capitol and was outraged when uh -huh. the security detail would not allow him to do so, and um, issues to do with the fact that he knew the crowd was armed, dangerous, hunting Mike Pence. And when he was urged by his aides to send out a tweet to try to bring the situation back under control, as opposed to doing that, he sent out a tweet uh, further riling up the crowd against Pence. And then I think very important, actually, Richard Donahue, who was part of Trump's Justice Department, indicating that when Trump tried to change the leadership of the Justice Department so as to get the Justice Department to send letters to select states, and we've got uh, Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, states that if he could somehow prevent their electors from voting in the Electoral College proceeding on January 6th, he might plausibly win the election or at least have it thrown into Congress where he thought he had a chance of prevailing. Donahue uh, testifying to the fact that he and many others in the Justice Department indicated they would resign rather than allowing the leadership to change without protest. And then we have the members of the committee themselves, right, vast majority Democrat, uh, two Republicans, although Republicans who are mainly disdained by their own party. And, and I want to be um, as clear as possible for a moment about right not only the composition of this committee, but on the one hand, the, the way in which it would differ from a legal proceeding, right? This is an investigative committee, a special investigative committee in the House of Representatives organized by the Democrats with uh, a select participation of Republicans, but only Republicans who met right Nancy Pelosi's standards. And the result is that um, these proceedings are one-sided. And, and, and that doesn't mean that they're not getting at the truth, but a court of law in the United States is a deliberately adversarial institution. And I think it's worthwhile noting, as opposed to trying to construct a singular clear cut narrative in the way that this committee, I think has done a very convincing job at the proceedings in a court of law would have different evidentiary standards and would have much more by the way of cross-examination, countervailing witnesses, efforts to draw out testimony from witnesses against Trump that is perhaps less selected and less clear cut than what the committee has chosen to show from its extensive interviews. And, and so while I think in a sense, the committee is clearly doing a public service by creating as clear a public account 
a historical record for these events, it is not a good conclusion to draw that a court of law would follow suit and, and make it so clear. The second thing I think I, I have to say here is that I come into this with a clear prior judgment on Donald Trump, one I suspect many people listening to this share, right? Which is to say, uh, I, I think he's um, a liar, he's a thug, he's a bully, he's a narcissist, he may very well be a psychopath, and he is ill-equipped to be president of the United States and his efforts to subvert that office to do his will to make it an instrument of his all but insatiable appetite for power and self-aggrandizement demeaned the office and represent a major threat to the United States. All of that to say, I am inclined to be very sympathetic with what the special inquiry has presented thus far. And I think we need to be careful in recognizing that for many Americans, they're not nearly so focused on this. They're not nearly so sympathetic with it. They may have exactly the opposite point of view. We have to remember that Donald Trump retains support from a substantial share of the American population, that those right Americans who support Donald Trump tend to inhabit a media ecosystem that exonerates and does not criticize Donald Trump. And, and so that they may be forming a very different judgment of, of these proceedings. Having said all of that, I, I now want to try to reconstruct what it seems to me the proceedings have revealed and to do so with an eye to the question, does this amount to sufficient cause for Donald Trump to be prosecuted uh, for inciting a riot or attempting to interfere with the registering of the results of the election for in essence engaging in a sustained coordinated conspiracy to defraud the American people by overturning the result of an election which is of course a central exercise of democratic sovereignty. And I think the, the, the short answer is yes, that, that, that at least with regards to the question of fact, the evidence now seems to me to be clear and uh, compelling that there are multiple and sustained aspects that taken together constitute a conspiracy. And, and so let me start with them and, and I'm taking them in rough chronological order, but I have to be clear, this is probably not systematic. This is, this is a, a, a rough effort to, to at least uh, highlight the key elements of what could be considered not just uh, lamentable, reproachable norm violation, but an illegal conspiracy that deserves prosecution. So first, relentless and knowing spreading of baseless election disinformation. And so one of the things that is clear from these hearings and from the reporting uh, surrounding January 6th and the couple months preceding them is that Donald Trump was told repeatedly that he had lost the election, that the claims about fraud were baseless, that they were being thrown out by judges as frivolous claims, that they were innuendo and fabrication, not reality. And that nevertheless, Donald Trump took the bully pulpit, the considerable megaphone and credibility that comes with the office of the president, knowing the degree of support that he had within his constituency and continued to repeat again and again and again that he had won the election, that the only reason that the 
outcome appeared to be different was because of fraud, deceit, and the malfeasance on the part of election officials, dead people voting, non-citizens voting, ballots being destroyed, new ballots being fabricated. And, and so th this is a, a, a month long, months long effort. It actually begins preceding the election, which again, I think is an important piece of evidence that Donald Trump knew prior to the election that he was likely to lose the election. Um, and so uh, th this is, I think, by itself, not decisive. Uh, you know, the, the, the president has a special responsibility, it seems to me, to not systematically mislead the American people. Uh, that's part of, it seems to me, the impeachment of Andrew Johnson going back 150 years. But having said all of that, um, there's probably a more clear cut mechanism for political than legal accountability for the president lying. And, and, and we'll go through this and, and try to disentangle those two issues a little bit, right? The mechanisms for political accountability are either, right, electoral, you, you, you don't remain popular, you don't get reelected, or um, uh, political, right, which is to say that you get impeached if you're the president of the United States or another high official. And unfortunately, those mechanisms do not seem to be working very well in America in 2022. And, and so we're left with the question of looking at his relentless lying about the election as an element of an overall conspiracy to defraud the people of the United States. Second element is the effort to delay vote counting and reporting and to claim electoral victory on the basis of a partial count of the vote. And, and, and we know that at 3 a.m. on November 7th, Donald Trump declared that he had won the election. And it, it does appear that the effort here was to indicate that the election was over within hours of it being conducted. And, and, and the initial hope, it appears, was that Donald Trump would have won the votes that would be quickly counted because Trump supporters were gonna vote in person, Biden supporters more likely to vote by mail and mail ballots in most jurisdictions are counted after in-person ballots are counted. And, and that the effort was then to halt the tabulation of the ballots less likely to support Trump or to just say, this election is over, everything after tonight doesn't matter. Third effort is, is the effort to use the courts to challenge ballots and results. And I, I'm going to stop at that part of, of, of this allegation for a moment, because I think many people who are looking at this say, well, he had the right to do that. He's within his rights to use the courts. And I think that we have to be careful. Right, and, and another contrast between Donald Trump and historical predecessors is with um, Al Gore and the 2000 presidential election. I've spoken with you just last week about the way in which the Supreme Court's decision in Bush v. Gore is a very peculiar idiosyncratic decision that we need to worry that it's a strict party line decision in the sense that all Supreme Court justices appointed by Republicans vote for Bush, in essence, vote to halt the counting of the Florida election. All justices appointed by Democrats vote against. But nevertheless, Al Gore stops all legal challenges, concedes and accepts the outcome at that point, right? And, and, and so what does it mean to use the courts to legitimately challenge ballots and results? I think we need a richer normative account than to say, um, it's within your right because that's the right venue to do it in. I think we also need to ask, what is the motivation for doing it? What does one hope to accomplish? And we now know that 
Trump was told repeatedly, you have no chance of succeeding with these challenges, and he nevertheless chose to proceed. And I think that speaks to the fact that the reason to launch the legal challenges to ballots and results was not so much any thought that there was genuine fraud or malfeasance, so much as that this is another way of spreading the disinformation, the lie, because the friendly right-wing media will cover the court proceedings and in so doing led credibility to the disinformation campaign, right? And, and, and so this is a, another aspect then of the propaganda effort. The, the, the fourth uh, aspect, and, and now I think we're getting to the point when you look at the fourth aspect in light of the previous three, that, that we are beginning to see genuine illegality, right? And, and, and this is the effort to create false slates of state electors, right? To, to get Arizona and Georgia and Wisconsin and Michigan to present alternative, parallel, unauthorized, unrepresentative electors for the electoral college in order to create a situation where when on January 6th, the electoral college meets, there's some question, does the, do the electors of Arizona really represent the vote for Joe Biden? Or are there two slates and do we therefore have to declare Arizona's votes invalid or uncountable? And if that happens with Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, and Wisconsin, guess what? Either Trump wins because those other four states have been thrown out and he won enough of the other states that he goes on to, to win the electoral college election. Once those states electors have been deemed too uh, contested to be allowed to be counted or else it goes to the House of Representatives, which is the constitutional mechanism to break a lock in the Electoral College. And please note that in the House of Representatives, each state's delegation gets one vote. And state by state, there were 26 Republican delegations, 24 uh, Democratic delegations. And so Trump at least thought he had some chance of prevailing this way. But, but please note, not to lose the forest for the trees, these are fraudulent slates of electors. These are people who are presenting fraudulent documentation to the National Archives in order to be registered when in fact they are completely extra legal. They do not have any of the support of the state law that would be required for them to actually be electors. And it now appears that Donald Trump and his team were directly involved in producing the alternative elector slates. Fifth element, bully Mike Pence, the vice president into declaring state electors invalid. And, and this speaks to Pence's role, which is a purely formal and ceremonial role in chairing the electoral college and registering its results, gaveling them into the history books. And, and we see this that for weeks, Donald Trump tried to persuade, to bully, to cajole Mike Pence as he had number, numerous election officials at the state level into doing his will and going along with this scheme and saying, no, I can't say who won this election or I'm going to say that Donald Trump won this election because I have to throw out Arizona, Georgia, et cetera. Uh, Trump also works to enlist congressional allies to declare state electors invalid. I believe it's 128 members of the House of Representatives and eight senators who votes vote to 
call into question some of the electors, right? And so even after the invasion of the Capitol, a substantial portion of the Republican delegation in Congress is still going along with the scheme. And I think that that's important to recognize that this is not just Donald Trump in the White House sulking and screaming. It is in fact a conspiracy with multiple actors, some of them in high office, high elected office. It is a substantial portion of the Republican party. And now let me just back up for a second because I think there's something else I, I wanna say about the hearings. And, and, and so let me go back to note that um, of the faces I put on the board here, four out of five are uh, elected or appointed officials. I guess they're all uh, elected, appointed officials except for Brad Raffsenberger. Uh, Carolyn Edwards is obviously a police officer, but that they are all also Republicans, right? And so that part of the effort of this committee, and please note it's vice chair, Liz Cheney is herself a Republican Trump critic, is to drive a wedge between Donald Trump and the Republican Party, or at least portions of the Republican Party, including members of his own administration, some of whom have said that they would still vote for Donald Trump in 2024, although they do not agree with what he did in the months after the election of 2020. Very peculiar position to be in, it seems from the outside. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that when we look at these congressional allies, right, and, and, and they remain in power, in force, and loyal to Donald Trump, that they were not as principled or law abiding or unwilling to violate the norms of democracy as were members of Trump's own administration, right? And, and that part of the force of the investigative committee is to display, look, you may support Donald Trump as a politician and his policies, but that should not translate into supporting him when he turns against the law and against democracy. Uh, having said all of that, clearly a large number of Republican members of Congress were, and the White House was carefully coordinating with them in this sustained and carefully orchestrated plan to overturn the election. Um, final element that I think is incredibly important and quite damning is that Donald Trump strongly considered replacing acting Attorney General Jeff Rosen. Please note that Jeff Rosen is acting attorney general because William Barr has resigned after telling the president that his claims that the election was fraudulent are bullshit, right? And that he um, is repeating lies and now using that basis to try to break the law. Barr wants no part of it. He walks away, Rosen takes over. Rosen, however, is unwilling to do what Trump wants him to do, what an acting assistant attorney general, Jeffrey Clark, has recommended. And, and, and this is right part of the John Eastman plan to use the looseness of the electoral count law of the late 19th century that is still the main law governing the way in which presidential elections are registered and, and validated um, to, to um, send letters from the Department of Justice to the states that, right, Trump has acted to get false slates of electors appointed to, to suggest to those states there's sufficient evidence of fraud and malfeasance that the Department of Justice does not consider to the vote tally to be reliable and therefore you should withdraw 
your electors from the Electoral College. And please note that these are all states in which the Republicans are in control of the state legislature. And so there's some thought, as Trump put it, you know, you just send the letters and leave the rest to me and the members of Congress, right? We'll work on the state officials if you'll just send these letters. And it's only because a large number of officials within the Department of Justice says to Trump, we will resign in mass if you attempt to replace Rosen with Clark that Trump ultimately relents. And it's, it's in light of all of this that I then say the, the final element to this, uh, element eight, and, and, and no, we, we now know, right? A tweet going back to December, uh, various efforts within the White House to make sure that the rally of January 6th is well attended. The knowledge that the president has that people in the crowd are armed, his desire to allow them to keep their arms and still attend the rally, the fact that he wants to join them at the Capitol, all of this indicates his state of mind as well as his intention. And it does appear that he certainly intended to disrupt violently the counting of the Electoral College as part and parcel of this overall plan. Now, having said that, I want to be as clear as possible. I don't think January 6th, the invasion of the Capitol, the so-called insurrection is the crux of the plan. I think it's just an element of the plan. I think it's the most visible, the most violent, the most upsetting, and therefore it's the one that in a sense we have naturally paid attention to, but that part of the work of the Congressional Investigative Committee has been to situate the insurrection as part of this broader scheme. And that's really important, right? Because frankly, it might be difficult to prove in a court of law that President Trump deliberately, knowingly, and willfully incited the insurrection, right? He, he is often careful. One of the things that's funny is you look at the conversation that he has with Brad Raffsenberger, for instance, is how much of what comes out of his mouth is word salad, right? It, it, it's a borderline incoherent stream of thought. The message he intends to convey is clear, find 11,000 votes. But the way in which he says it and supports it is, in fact, not entirely legible or coherent. And that may very well be deliberate. He is smart enough to know that what he is doing is illegal and could be prosecuted. And therefore, he does not want to leave the clear trail of evidence. The point I'm making is, if it were only January 6th, it might be hard to make the case against Donald Trump. Because of the other seven elements of this, I think it begins to be more plausible to suggest that Donald Trump did in fact engage in a conspiracy. Now, before I go any further, let me say one more thing about this. The law is a mess on a lot of these issues, right? And, and, and so one of the things that has been the case hitherto in American history is that no person, and, and this is where Al Gore comes to mind, right, as, as, as someone who could have tried to engage in uh, a concerted effort to contest George W. Bush's claim to victory, um, that, that no person has tried to take advantage of the openings and latitude that American law creates or leaves there around the presidential election. And it helps us to see, right, the way in which the law assumes that it will be met halfway by the goodwill and normative bearings or orientation of those who are governed by the law. I think that's a, a, a thing that is generally true, right? We, we see this in so-called work to the rule strikes. If you just let the rules regulate what you do, 
Oftentimes it's going to be a mess. It relies on judgment, interpretation, goodwill, and an uh, ethical compass. And, and, and Donald Trump lacked that altogether. And here I want to say that this complicates prosecuting him because we, we, we have to be clear. I think a lot of our outrage about this is the sense that he was trying to subvert democracy and that we are therefore perhaps less um, inclined to work out the technical issue. Did he also break the law? Yes, he was trying to subvert the democracy. Was it illegal for him to do so? And, and Merrick Garland has to be convinced not only that he was trying to subvert democracy, but that he explicitly broke the law. Our law does not have the kind of clarity we should want it to have, in part because it assumes that the people governed by that law understand the intent of the law and want to abide by the spirit as well as the letter of the law. Now, having laid all of this out, let me get to the bigger questions, right, uh, that, that this rises, raises. Uh, should Donald Trump be prosecuted? And I wanna start with the legal considerations. Are the elements of a crime clear? And I believe they are, although I'm not a lawyer and I have not studied the technical details of the law, it certainly appears that way from a lay perspective, particularly a perspective of someone who believes a lot in democracy and is no fan of Donald Trump. Would a jury be likely to convict? And here, right again, I have to emphasize that the rules of evidence and the standards of proof that would be at play in a criminal trial are very different than those that are at play in considering the report of a congressional investigative committee. And, and so it would have to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt and everything that would be possible would be done to create elements of a doubt, right? And, and while the court of public opinion is obviously different than the court of law, I think it's worthwhile looking for a moment at some of what we're seeing from the court of public opinion. And, and so just a, a, a recent poll um, from uh, late June, um, how many people are actually paying attention to the hearings? And, and here, at first, it may look a little discouraging. It's only about a third of the American public that are following it very closely or somewhat closely. Um, having said that, it's only about a third of the American public who watches the World Series, right? And, and so in a sense, um, this is perhaps as big a media spectacle or close to as big uh, a viewership as you can get. But please note that, you know, about two thirds of America are not so closely or not closely at all attuned to this. And so one advantage of actually prosecuting Trump would be to call further attention to it. Um, do you think the select committee is fair and impartial? 60% yes, 38% no. Do you think Trump bears responsibility for the attack on the Capitol? Almost 50% say a great deal. Another roughly 10% say a good amount. And 24% say none at all. Now again, Right. This is this is probably the 24 percent who watches Fox News and our media environment is such that a substantial portion of the American population watches a network that is not covering these proceedings and is systematically committed to exonerating the president and indicating that this is just political persecution. So it's not surprising and hopefully that would be overcome in a court of law. But. I think it's still indicative of, of a consideration that Merrick Garland has to take seriously. Would it be likely that Trump might be exonerated or at least not convicted? And if so, might that in fact enhance his power and then further damage American democracy? Uh, final uh, question I just wanted to share with you from this poll. Do you think Donald Trump uh, 
is, uh, should be charged with a crime for his role in this incident. And I think it's worthwhile noting that a majority of Americans now say yes. And so this has increased as a result of these proceedings. Um, the prosecution would have to hope that they could likewise get a jury, not to 58% or 60% or two thirds, but to unanimity around conviction. Now, third issue that Merrick Garland has a statutory duty to consider is whether it would be in the public interest to prosecute Trump. And wow. I, I wanna suggest that there's both a narrow question here and a broader political question. The narrow question is, in a sense, is the president above the law? Richard Nixon famously said, we have the recording of it. If the president does it, it's not a violation of the law. His idea, right, which clearly Trump digested and then amplified, is that the president enforces the law, but does not have the law enforced upon him. Right. And, and so one reason to prosecute Trump would be to make it absolutely clear that the president of the United States is accountable for obeying the laws of the United States. And please note, and, and I hate to say it, but I think it's true, there's a decent likelihood that Donald Trump, if not prosecuted or not convicted, will be the next president of the United States. And if he is the next president of the United States, and if the lesson he has digested from January 6th and the conspiracy preceding it is that he can do anything. The second act of the presidency of Donald Trump will be far worse than the first act in terms of violation of the law, bullying, enemies, using the power of the office to pursue his narrow and often vindictively self-interested agenda as opposed to a broader public agenda. Similarly, though a slightly broader question, does the law work impartially or is it different for the powerful and the ordinary? And here I just wanna point out, right? Hundreds of people are being prosecuted. Some of them are already serving sentences for invading the Capitol. They invaded the Capitol because the president of the United States repeatedly told them the election had been stolen and did so knowing that it was untrue and knowing that he had a great deal of credibility and loyalty from his followers, right? And, and so the idea that ordinary people go to jail for crimes that their leaders can commit with impunity suggests that the law is an instrument only for ordinary people and their restraint and not for the powerful. And please note that this is a widespread idea and not without reason in the United States today. The failure to prosecute Donald Trump while his followers go to jail for doing what he encouraged them to do would further the perception that the law is unfair and an indication of the deep unfairness of American society, politics, and policy in the 21st century. Pivoting to the broader political question, can the law be used to restore norms once they begin to decay. And, and again, right, I, I have to be as clear as possible about this, right? The fact that Donald Trump did all of this is symptomatic of a broader problem in American democracy. The fact that many leaders, elected leaders in Congress went along with him. The fact that a majority of Republicans continue to parrot the lies that Donald Trump pours out whenever it suits his interests is indicative of a really important decay in the culture of democracy in the United States. And that the question here, it's a deep philosophical and sociological question. Once culture begins to change, can law be used to change culture? 
would prosecuting Trump, to, to put it differently, restore the Republican Party to its democratic fidelity, restore, I'm tempted to say, its sanity? How many persons currently inclined to support Trump might be persuaded by prosecuting him, by Garland deciding to prosecute him? And here I, I want to point out two things. The first is that it would certainly capture the public attention and force us to focus all the more on what Trump did and is alleged to do and the legal rules as well as the normative expectations on the president of the United States. So there is a chance that some people who have not yet focused on this might focus on it. But please note, not only is it possible that Trump would not be convicted, that this would then allow him greater credibility going into 2024. But it is also entirely likely that the supporters of Trump, who are many of them um, deeply um, uh, susceptible to the politics of grievance, right, to the sense that this is unfair persecution, not legal prosecution, but just a vendetta against this man who was the first president who stood up for people like us in generations. And the consequence is that the elite are after him and trying to keep him from ever regaining power, that this might be deeply polarizing in an already polarized environment. I don't have an easy solution to this. I don't think that this is a question that admits of an easy answer. When I think about it, not in the context of 2022, but philosophy and sociology, I'm generally inclined to think that law does not have the capacity to change culture or repair the erosion and decay of norms in the way required, that, that, that it's generally not law that causes norms to decline and law cannot directly reinstate normative or cultural consensus once it's frayed. That in order to fix what is causing the decay and decline of the normative reservoir, right? Levitsky and Zablack call it the guardrails, the, the, the commitments of the political elite, but also of the ordinary people to democratic institutions, procedures, and ideas, that, that what is required is addressing the underlying causes, not simply trying to legislate the norms themselves. That will have to be a topic for another lecture. I do want to talk about why the Republican Party seems to be increasingly moving in the direction of an anti-democratic or authoritarian party, a party that will, as this shows, do anything it can to hold on to power, including subverting the outcomes of an election when the election doesn't go its way. So for today, let me just conclude by saying this would be the first time we'd ever do this, right? The first time that we would prosecute a former president and potential future rival, that an administration controlled by a president from one party, an attorney general appointed by that president would go after the leader of the rival party. And it, there is a grave risk of politicizing the criminal justice system and with it, the rule of law, at least for a substantial portion of the American people. And so uh, I, I want to be as clear as possible. I don't like the analogy, but I, I don't have another good one. This is like chemotherapy. It's like taking a poison in order to prevent something still more destructive from taking hold and taking over. It's a situation where there's no good answer. But having said that, that doesn't relieve us of the need to decide. My current inclination is to think that on balance, it would be better to prosecute Donald Trump than to let him walk away scape free from clear culpability that led to deaths, that led to a major and grave threat to American democracy, that 
is um, really continuing to plague our political system as well. So with that, let me guess that some of you may have something to say about all of this. Let's start our discussion. Who wants to start us out? I can't believe that nobody has anything to say. Am I missing someone or are you uh, a little shell-shocked at this point? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Flossie, yeah. I, I think it might be the, the first time I've ever <laughs> put you in that position. Do you have something to say? The only thing I can think of is that he has to be brought to trial. He has to be found guilty and offered this way out that he can choose his own way of execution. <laughs> <laughs> he can choose to hang, or he can choose to um, be shot, whatever. That's it. Wasi, well, do you believe in the death penalty? He has to be brought to trial. Otherwise, the whole thing is a walk away. Yeah, I, I, so, so I'm inclined to agree with you, and, 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 and here, you know, we have to be careful of having our judgment overwhelmed by one consideration because there's powerful considerations on both sides of the scale here. But when we think about not holding him to account, it seems to send the message the president is above the law. He can do anything he wants with impunity. And please note that we have one of our two major parties increasingly committed to the idea of using the instruments of the state to prosecute the culture war, et cetera, right? And, and, and so even if it's not Trump, who, who by personality and history has shown himself to be the kind of person who will do vicious things if given the power to do so, even if it's DeSantos or somebody else, we should be very careful of setting that precedent. And then in addition to that, what does it say about the law? The law is there only to hold yeah. ordinary, poor, or middle-class people to yeah. account, but not the powerful or the rich. Uh, so, so those are really powerful considerations, but there are considerations on the other side and they are powerful as well. Um, Anybody else? So, Marianne, are, are you saying you've got a comment? And Barbara, are you saying you've got a comment? I, yes, I have a Go comment. Ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I think the law needs to be respected uh, if it's at all possible. I think there needs to be a trial. I think he needs to be convicted. I do not think that he needs to be sitting in jail. I think that uh, if Biden would pardon him in that situation, it might keep us from having another civil war. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so in preparing the, the lecture, I was, I was looking at um, the book we, we've talked about together before, How Democracies Died by Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Sablat. And there's a passage, I actually put a, a slide together. Let me see if I can get it for you very quickly. Because uh, because you raised the specter of civil war, right? Um, so um, th this is the, the quotation, right? Um, and, and, and so one of the questions I, I think we've got to get at, I, I suggested that law by itself cannot restore norms. And so if norms are going to be restored, you have to figure out what's eroding the norms. And, and here I think that race is extremely important, although not the exclusive variable. So, so this is what Levitsky and Zablat say. Writing, and, and the, this is the beginning of the conclusion of the book. Writing this book has reminded us that American democracy is not as exceptional as we sometimes believe. There's nothing in our constitution or culture to immunize us against democratic breakdowns 
We have experienced political catastrophe before when regional and partisan enmities so divided the nation that it collapsed into civil war. Our constitutional system recovered and Republican and Democratic leaders developed new norms and practices that would undergird more than a century of political stability. But that stability came at the price of racial exclusion and authoritarian single party rule in the South. It was only after 1965 that the United States fully democratized. And paradoxically, that very process began a fundamental realignment of the American electorate that has once again left our parties deeply polarized. This polarization deeper than at any time since the end of Reconstruction has triggered the epidemic of norm breaking that now challenges our democracy. And I would just point out to you that Levitsky and Sablat look prophetic when they suggest that Donald Trump has, uh, I think it's seven out of the eight or eight out of the nine attributes of an authoritarian leader, right? And, and, and they're writing that I think in 2017 uh, before we see the abuses of power that occur in the last couple of years of his presidency. But coming back to this question. So, so Marion's suggestion is we prosecute Trump, we convict him. By the way, there's no guarantee that that happens, right? You know, we, we, Merrick Garland can decide to prosecute him. It's only the jury that can decide to convict him. And that is not something I think we should be confident will happen. But then we ask Biden to pardon him. And the fact that Biden pardons him is a conciliatory gesture that depolarizes our politics, right? And it's, it's a wonderful story. It's, it, it, it's got the, the kind of narrative arc you would want from a good political movie. The question is, does it work? And there, I think we've got to ask the question, what's driving our polarization? And right, Levitsky and Zablat have an answer. It's the diversification of America and the erosion of white privilege with it. And the fact that one of our two political parties has always been a party of white superiority since the end of the Civil War. And that party cannot be viable electorally if it doesn't serve the interest of its constituents in maintaining white privilege, white uh, dominance and white uh, social status and standing, right? And, and so is pardoning Trump sufficient to, to, to undo all of that, to, to, to break the spell of the demand to maintain um, white superiority? And I, I just, say all of this so that we can recognize the depth of the problem that we face with American democracy in the 21st century. It would be a, a, a important conciliatory ge gesture, a deep effort to try to depolarize. Please note that Biden came in on a promise to turn down the heat on American politics, to be more reasonable, to restore bipartisan compromise, it hasn't gone very well so far, right? And, and I'm just concerned that it might be hard to, with a single gesture, no matter how magnanimous, break the spiral of polarization we're in right now. Barbara, you had a, a comment as well? I did. Um, I think the real benefit of um, your lecture today is that uh, you uh, made us see the complexity of the issues. It's not just January 6th. It's not just the Electoral College uh, abuse. It's, it's not just any of the long list of, of uh, uh, erosions that uh, Trump and the party have uh, worked to develop. And uh, that, that makes it, so complicated to find a way through to uh, make some change. And I'm, I'm just now catching up with New York Times Magazine and reading the article on May 29th about the anti-vaccine 
uh, believers and the campaigns and and uh, you know the, the writers are saying this this is a one of a kind uh, antagonism to government. It's it's new. It's a new kind of of antagonism to uh, the balance between uh, the good of the people and the good of the individual or the wishes of the individual. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, Barbara. And and. Um... I would add when I was preparing this and, and there's so much and, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about the Supreme Court and, and in part to, to not have to be quite so attentive to the, the complexity, messiness and depressing character of contemporary American politics. But having said that, um, the series that the Times did a couple months ago on Tucker Carlson, I think is really good and important also. And, and so please note, it's not just the Republican Party. It's our public sphere and, and the role of the media in the public sphere in delivering reliable, verifiable information as the kind of base on which we start our political discussions, right? And, and, and so again, would prosecuting Trump persuade some people currently inclined to support him, not to support him. Would being able to establish in the public record the complete indifference of the former president of the United States of the legality, to, to the legality or defensibility of what he was doing and desperately trying to cling to power by any right far-fetched scheme possible help to bring some members of the Republican Party to their senses and say, yes, we want to win, but there are things more important than winning, right? And, and, and only in those circumstances would this be a salutary exercise. And Tucker Carlson is not going to assist with that at all. Fox News, Breitbart, uh, et cetera, will do their best to make sure that this story gets a very different treatment for its viewers. And please note, that's a substantial portion of the American population. Uh, and you've got your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, I do. I, I, at this point in, in history, were there to be a trial and a conviction, I think that that would not help at all. I think that the people who believe in the in Trumpism would that, that that might bring on the civil war. I don't see them changing their mind. I don't see any conviction changing their minds. They didn't believe the election was real. They wouldn't believe that. And I would also be terribly concerned if there was a trial of the safety of the jurors. Yeah, and and so let me say two things about that. I, I think we, we have to be careful to differentiate the diehard Trump supporters. And, and I'm making this up, let's call that a third of the American population from people who are focused on other things, right? And, and, and so please note, I, I, I reading Levitsky and Sablat, I emphasize the element of race. I think we also need to pay equal attention to the element of economic inequality, right? And so there are a lot of people who feel like they've been completely left out of income and wealth creation in the United States for the last 50 years, that the elite are completely indifferent to their sufferings, that this is an economy with haves and have nots, and that the people who were supposed to be rising in our society have been completely left out for a long time now and the elite are completely indifferent, right? And, and some of those people, yes, they're really aggravated with the status quo. And the fact that inflation has set in is making their life all the much worse. And they're not really focused on Donald Trump's character. They just want a vehicle for expressing their anger and resentment at the unfairness of the American economy and the unresponsiveness of our polity, right? That's a much more sympathetic description, by the way, of what's leading some people to 
trumps Republican Party than is the idea of maintaining white privilege. And, and I just, I think it's very hard to pull those two apart. They, they, they uh, complement and supplement and reinforce each other. And uh, at this point, the, the, the two may be inseparable. But so would some of those people focus a little bit more on just the deep personal character flaws of Donald Trump. And, and maybe that would lead them to be a little bit less likely to support him. I don't know. Let me point two more things out here. And, uh, you know, the complexity here makes it hard to have an equivocal answer to the, these issues. One of them is that a certain number of the Trump supporters absolutely like him. I think in the same way people like Mick Jagger, right? Because he says out loud what other people think, but they can't wow. get away with it, right? Mm -hmm. That's part of his charisma, part of his appeal. He gets to be a uh, racist, a sexist, vulgar, and by the way, a lawbreaker. And that might just increase some of the enthusiasm for him. But final consideration, in addition to the possibility that he would not be convicted, there is the possibility that he would be convicted. And that's going to keep him from running for office again. And he may be a singularly dangerous politician. And maybe it would be good for our society, even if it doesn't address any <laughs> other underlying issues, at least to have him in jail instead of on the campaign trail. Um, so uh, I see Barbara's camera yeah, turned David, to somebody David else. Are, on Barbara's computer. Um, a question I have is, and it's in response to a piece I read in the Atlantic a couple of days ago about Mitt Romney, which seemed like uh, some traditional Republicans who believe in um, the kind of uh, uh, the, the kind of politics that characterized the 1980s and early 90s before the moral majority came along. Uh, do they have any role or are they just completely out of it in all this? Because it seems to me that that's a, another group that could uh, be a part of trying to uh, find a, finding a way not to have a civil war. Yeah, so uh, I, I think uh, another person you might name here is Lynn Cheney, right? As, as a, a, a Republican, and, and, and I think in a sense, right, Lynn Cheney is the kind of Republican who um, many Republicans post moral majority, if you will, ideologically have sympathy for. But having said that, it, it's also the case that um, it appears today that that wing of the Republican Party is not going to win elections. And that might be because they look too much like the Democrats, too elite, too unwilling or unable to serve as vehicles to channel resentment and anger about the unfairness of American economic, uh, the, the American economic system or grievance at the shattering of expectations, especially among white people who thought they were going to continue to occupy a privileged position in our society. So I think, you know, deep down, this is both a social and a political problem. Can the Republican Party be a viable part of a two-party system in the absence of having something like, and let's call them MAGA Republicans, Make America Great Again Republicans, the, without the support of Trump or the trump -ists. Um, And I don't see by itself the, the possibility of somebody who says, I'm a more reasonable Republican regaining <clears throat> control of the party. I, I think we really have to hope <laughs> that, that, that if Trump is prosecuted, if he is convicted, if in so doing we create a public record that makes it clear to a substantial portion of let's call them uh, more mainstream Republicans, that this is just a bridge too far. 
that it may prompt a crisis of, of leadership in the Republican Party that leads them to, to um, re redirect their party. But that's a long, slow, difficult process. And they have the electoral catnip of the prospects for rapid current success that Trump opens for them waiting. I think it's really hard for a party and its leaders to resist that, especially in an era in which norms are eroding. Right. Yeah. I, I was looking for that. There's a, a, a good history of the Republican Party. I'll have to give this to, to you guys uh, next time we meet that the party uh, sense Goldwater that that looks at the, the kind of effort to bring under the same political roof, uh, kind of mainstream elite business interests and a populist, uh, often anti-establishment, sometimes racist stream, and how tricky that has been for the Republican Party to do, and how perhaps the period you were pointing us to would be a period in which the, the mainstream business elite wing of the party was in control and how it lost control. And by the way, Citizens United is really important in this story of how it lost control. It no longer holds the purse strings of electoral politics, the, the mainstream business wing. All right, everybody, we, we've gone over again. Good being with you again and uh, more to come. Uh, like I said, I had a lot more to talk about. We, we might spend another week on this topic, uh, looking more systematically at what's going on with the Republican Party. Uh, if not, there will be plenty else to talk about next week. Take care of yourselves, be careful, uh, be well, and see you next week. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, David. Bye. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye.